and Happy Clutch uh, we started last year in August, so this is actually last year's our anniversary, and I'm really proud that we keep going and we have more and more people now. We also do English events, which was highly requested. So um, I know sometimes people watch from abroad or um, lots of people even in Berlin that um, are more comfortable doing this in English and I'm fine either way. So I thought today I'm going to do an English one and I'm really excited to have you here today. And I must say I perused the website and I wanted to find someone who does something cool that we haven't talked about yet and I found you. <laughs> so I was very excited when um, you said that you would join us. So <laughs> I think this has been a few months in the planning. When did I first miss you? Like three uh, months ago? Like three months ago. Yeah, I you can see with... I was very excited. <laughs> yeah, we yeah, talked yeah. for the first time. Yeah, and um, immediately I knew this is cool. I must say I um, obviously Googled you and I saw videos of you talking about your research. Oh. <laughs> I was like, oh my God, I need her here. <laughs> so, um, I mean, I must say I'm a, I'm a, I'm a big fan already. So <laughs> I think maybe, I, so I have my own questions, of course. I'm going to um, start by asking a few questions of my own. If you have questions, please feel free to write them in the chat and we're going to all answer them afterwards, right? Yeah. So I'm wait until the end, you can type them now and they will stay there for us to um, Later, if you yeah, you know. I know I always have to type in right now, so feel free to do that. But also, don't think that we're ignoring you. We just have a lot of cool slides, so I think this yeah. is the easiest way, right? Um, I have my coffee here. I hope you all also having coffee or tea or whatever you drink. <laughs> so I'm gonna start my first questions. So. Okay. Um, Something that I always find interesting for all my speakers is how did you end up in science? <laughs> did you have someone inspire you as a child or like I'm a first generation scientist. I had really no one except my grandpa was like, look at this bug. <laughs> but I um, I'm, I'm the first one. How was it for you? Have you had other scientists in your family? Uh, no. No, I'm all. always the first generation. <laughs> you know my pain. Yeah, totally. <laughs> um, I, well, my mom used to work in a lab, mm -hmm. uh, like a um, microbiology lab or something like okay. that. So that was probably the first time I saw a microscope and I saw the dynamic inside a lab. Uh, that was interesting. My mom was also interested in biochemistry. Mm -hmm. She didn't study that, but I guess maybe got a little bit of interest in science. But I do not have anyone in my family who kind of took me to a museum and yeah. guided me and showed me like up here at the box. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So nothing like that. So it was like um, I just, I guess I just followed my own uh, interests mm -hmm. at the university because I'm kind of biologist who all her life dream about uh, mm. biology. I, <laughs> really, I, yeah. mean, I also know a colleague who I wanted to be an artist. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, so I wanted to be a musician. Oh, really? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I studied music before biology. Oh, I didn't know that. Cool. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so now we, we can we can talk about yeah, uh, that, that's like cool. how you become a scientist. Yeah, yeah. So so no, I mean. I, I didn't uh, have anyone at home and any inspiration before I was like, I don't know, 18 mm -hmm, or something mm -hmm. like that. Okay. Yeah. And you said you studied before, but um, what did you study for your bachelor's and your master's? And where did you study? Did you study here or where did you first start out? Um, well, as probably people have guessed already, <laughs> I am not a Berliner and I am not a German. <laughs> Uh, I come from Colombia, uh, so I studied my bachelor and my master's in Colombia mm -hmm. uh, in two local universities. Um, and so, yeah, I did all my undergrad studies over there. Mm -hmm. Okay, and did you study biology or did you just you study yeah. music or? No, <laughs> well, the music was before, before my professional career. So I studied music since I was... Um, 
eight or nine years old until I was, I don't know, 18. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So it was kind of a long time where, while other kids were playing outside in the playground, I was playing oboe in a, in oh, a conservatory oh, yeah, right? <laughs> and nice. singing also. Yeah. So it was, I mean, my whole childhood had to do more with music mm. than with insects or biology. Mm -hmm. But I was always interested. So uh, I studied biology in Bogota, uh, that's the mm -hmm. capital of Colombia, my city, my hometown. Um, in, and I studied, uh, there is um, a career, like a program uh, that is called, um, it's, a, it's biology, mm -hmm. but it's, you are educated to teach others. Oh, biology. I see. Okay. Yeah. okay. Mm -hmm. And then after that, I did a master's, which was more into this scientific Mm. part of my career so more into biology uh, and that master's was on systematics um, mm -hmm. so it's a little bit of a uh, taxonomy I mean science that names organisms uh, and classify them but also a little bit of evolution phylogenetics and, and all that stuff mm -hmm. before I, I went further in my education okay well, cool I always like to know what people did beforehand you know <laughs> Because I was not into science. I wanted to study English literature, you know, and here we are. <laughs> so I did not do that. I ended up doing and then biology. And, yeah. I find interesting that we all uh, can be yeah. of so many interests we mm -hmm. can have, really. I mean, as scientists, I'm sure some of the scientists who are looking at us right now, they know they also have other passions, mm -hmm. really science. Yeah, yeah. So, Sure. We all have visited other <laughs> Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and I think yeah. sci scientists often thought of cursing their profession. I'm like, I wish I would have become this like jazz musician. Yeah. I mean I have, so. <laughs> <laughs> and you already said like you um from Colombia and I when you know when I did my research I also saw you worked in Copenhagen in the US, mm -hmm. right? And did you ever think you would end up in Germany? Uh, did you uh, only come here for the job or did you want to come here and the job was you know here is it um no i would end up working mm -hmm. for this museum uh, in my dream job mm -hmm. um but since i had uh, already in other places to germany or to europe uh, mm -hmm. i did my phd Denmark, mm -hmm. Copenhagen. Living in Europe was really something that I had experienced. Mm -hmm. So also living in the U.S. in Washington, um, that was uh, already there. So it was not so strange to mm -hmm. come to Germany. But I have to say, no. I mean, I didn't really plan it. Yeah, yeah. Um, I have to say, and I am sure the colleagues who are listening to us right now, <laughs> they will get the point and agree with me mm -hmm. in that. Uh, these positions in museums to be a curator, to be mm. in charge of a, collect a collection are not very uh, abundant. No. Very, very no. rare. Yeah, that's actually. true. So um, it is not easy to get a position in a museum these mm -hmm. days. Uh, so I have to say that, uh, of course, when I got this effort to come here to work in the field, I really wanted to work and it was... Uh, yes, for sure. Yeah, <laughs> I, yeah. really like, I, li I really like my job. I really like museums. So although I didn't dream about Germany specifically, mm -hmm. I, I had lived in Europe and the idea of working in museums was mm -hmm. very familiar to me. Yeah. And it wasn't a shock, like, oh my gosh, because Copenhagen is not that far away, right? But it's not the same. It's not the same, <laughs> no, of course, of course. Yeah, Berlin imagine. has its own personality. Yeah, it's that's a city that's actually true. with many personalities, I would say. <laughs> that's so, so funny. <laughs> Multiple personalities. I'm a Berliner, so I, I, you're correct. You know, even I sometimes when I wake up, I'm like, oh my gosh, Berlin is amazing, but also oh, sometimes you need a break. That's what I feel like. I feel that every neighborhood has its own personality. Oh yeah. And that's good because then yeah. you can travel around and you can explore a little bit of the hipster mm -hmm. oh, and true. then museums <laughs> and mm -hmm. stuff like that. Me too. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's, it's, it's very diverse. It's very interesting. True. People are also very loyal to their districts. I know I am. I used to live in a certain district. 
then I moved to a different one and I was so unhappy at first. I'm like, I can never live here. This is not where I belong now. <laughs> I still live there and I really like it. So moving countries, I guess, you know, a little bit different. Like. Yeah, it can be a lot different, mm -hmm. but humans are very similar. That's I mean, true. we all have similar desires, similar needs, mm. similar fears. We, so... Yeah, if we are probably in Colombia or Berlin or whatever. Mm -hmm. And I find that, yeah, we probably look different, speak different language, but behind yeah. there are many. It's true. They're really nice. <laughs> <laughs> well, now you nice, right? Yeah. Or a little bit. <laughs> so you said you interested in science and then biology did you always know you want to studying you know insect flies mosquitoes we really like mosquitoes are great flies are amazing i know they annoy me how did you end Most up being, yeah <laughs> would say that <laughs> how did you end up actually diving into this field you know um, how did you get there um that was around the 2000s early mm -hmm. 2000s when I took my course in entomology and I had this great professor, uh, Alexander Garcia. Oh, it was difficult not to get involved mm -hmm. and you know. Yeah. So um, I, I started uh, studying in, during the university, um, but I didn't have like a favorite group back then, mm -hmm. maybe beetles. They look cute and they are everywhere they have they have they um, play so different different roles in nature so they were very interesting to me but during those years there were some tv series that were very popular uh, i'm talking about csi i'm talking uh -huh. about these series about crimes and then i heard about insects playing an important role in solving crimes mm -hmm. so I got interested. There were already some students from my university who were developing uh, their. We have like a, a bachelor thesis, mm -hmm. uh, so uh, some of them were already working in, in um, insects that are important in entomology. Uh, so I I saw a connection, an interesting mm -hmm. connection. As I came from music, I mean, that, that is a part of an important role. So music, um, all these things played a role and I wanted to make a connection. Mm -hmm. And I thought forensic entomology was a perfect connection because it's using insects to help society mm -hmm. to solve crimes, right? So that's how I ended up with insects and with a particular interest in, in flies. Because mm -hmm. when you think of forensic entomology, it, flies are a more important group of organisms that provide more information sometimes than beetles. Mm -hmm. So that's how I, I ended up. I really like flies from the beginning. <laughs> uh, so I understand you guys. Yeah. Those who are behind the screen, I totally get if you're annoyed by insects, particularly by flies, yeah. because I have the same some Always time ago. Always around your head. Always. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But, um, but they, they, have, uh, they have so much importance for science, for agriculture, for entomology, um, that I, I thought it was interesting mm -hmm. to, to study them. And started learning about them. I mean, look at me. You I mean, <laughs> never went back to yeah. music or to anything. <laughs> I cool. just stay with flies. I, yeah. I actually also told my parents when I um, was like a little bit about what you do. The first thing my mom said, she's like, oh, it's like <laughs> so yeah. first thing they were for and flies they're like oh yeah that's how we can solve crimes and stuff they were immediately that's the connection they made so yeah. <laughs> but it's funny because in tv series they portrayed forensic forensic entomologists are to me those in these tv series are genius i mean they just take a larvae mm -hmm. look at from this distance and say 
Oh yeah, that's Lucilia Siricata. Uh, this person died like three days ago. And I'm like, you wow. <laughs> I can't do that. I've been studying guys for two years. And no, I can't. Yeah. <laughs> it's it is nowadays to me it's funny to look at this TV series. Of course, yeah. Because yeah. there are many things that are portrayed in of course they have to sh make a show, I yeah, understand. Yeah. But the things that they show in this series do not yeah. happen in, in real yeah. Laugh. It's communication. It's no. just entertainment, I guess. Hold. <laughs> you know, preserved. Listen. For completely, complete. of complete. There's never anything missing. You know. Of course. Yeah. <laughs> so I know. What you mean. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But um, what you what you talked about already sounds super exciting. So, did you ever actually help solve crimes? Is that something, um, or is that something that was your motivation to study flies? Or did you actually, you know, work cases or, you know, go to a crime scene? Is that also yeah. something that when you When did? I started as a student mm -hmm. uh, learning about flies, I wanted to become a forensic entomologist. Mm -hmm. uh, that was for sure. And I joined, I did my, my bachelor thesis. At, a, at an institution that in Colombia is like the FBI of Colombia. Ah, so it's, it is called, um, let me translate it. <laughs> <laughs> so it is the um, National Institute of Medical uh, Legal Medicine mm -hmm. and Forensic Sciences. Okay. So they, they are the lab mm -hmm. of the um, justice system in Colombia. So I went there and they didn't have a forensic entomology lab. Uh, but they were starting one mm. so there was a, there was a biologist already there trying to organize all the insects that had been collected in crime scenes for years also some insects that um, this person and all had collected in uh, um, mm. made by students from different universities so there was a lot of material that uh, was already there to be studied mm. No one uh, or very few people look at this flag before than, than uh, this research group we created. Um, a few years later, they finally established and opened the first uh, forensic entomology mm -hmm. lab in Colombia. It was one of the first Latin American countries that had these uh, facilities. And it was a wonderful place. Um, I was a bachelor, then I did my master's. Um, I had uh, like on and off worked uh, for them mm -hmm. uh, for this uh, lab. Um, mo the longest period was in 2010, uh, and I was part of the uh, research group mm. that was studying these insects uh, from from crime scenes in Colombia. Um, all the forensic scientists are not allowed to do to go to the crime scene. Okay. Is not it is not again like TV series mm -hmm. show. Maybe it happens like that in the U.S. Maybe, uh, but it, but not in Colombia. Okay. Uh, you're not allowed to go to orbs um, mm. in the crime scene. So there is a, a section of the police called like criminal police, uh, and they, the and they are you? the ones who go to uh, study or or collect take pictures mm -hmm. of the crime scene and all this stuff and then the corpse is uh, taken to the institute uh, and then all the doctors the medical uh, staff they they do the um, autopsy mm -hmm. and so it was funny because in the beginning it was not uh, very um, uh, clear that the first person uh, the first scientist who had to study and get closer to the corpse was actually the forensic entomologist. Mm -hmm. Because, uh, of course, if other people go to the corpse, insects will fly away. Of course, yeah, yeah. Right. Or some of them will crawl and mm -hmm. hide in a, I don't know, in a dark place yeah, in yeah. the house where the corpse was. So it was not well understood that forensic anthropologists had to go there mm. and also look around how the place was mm. to understand how insects got there, why. Mm -hmm. and so it, there, there was a lot of things that we didn't know in the beginning. I, uh, so in the beginning, uh, and I think it is like done like that today, 
that uh, forensic entomologists in Colombia study the insects that the police collect for them, um, which sometimes is, is very well preserved evidence, sometimes it's not, mm -hmm. because in the beginning, the police was not trained to do this. They are yeah, not yeah. entomologists, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. So we trained them also. Uh, we trained them, we told them how to collect insects. We told them about the different uh, developmental stages of insects and which uh, ones have to be preserved in ethanol or mm -hmm. alcohol or in different preservants. So it was really, really a big, big learning process uh -huh. for all of us. And eventually we were able to produce reports mm -hmm. for the um, justice system of Colombia uh, for, for uh, a number um, number of cases mm -hmm. I produced reports for there was probably more than a hundred oh, wow, like cool. it is it is a great tool um, and I know that in that I haven't been working as a forensic mm -hmm. anthropologist uh, there have been many advances in the techniques that they are using to identify insects to collect them mm -hmm. to rear them in lab um, so it, it was uh, forensic anthropology was a very very I don't work like that anymore, but, but it was great to help. Be a part of that, that could, right? Yeah. Exactly, yeah. that I could help uh, my country where, as most people know, the levels of violence are very high, mm -hmm. so um, solving crimes is, is a priority mm -hmm. there. Wow, that's really cool. You said you, you don't really do this anymore, and we can talk a little bit more about what you do now, too. So um, we have some slides, right? Do you want to yeah. share the screen? So uh, we can do it. My presentation is uh, is related to my work mm -hmm. because it happens that some of the pieces are forensically important. Ah, there you so go. that's how I got to the group of SI study. Yes. Yeah, that should be fine. Okay. Okay. Um, before I start, I want to tell the that there will be some technical uh, words, there technical language in the presentation. I will try to make it as simple as possible. And I will try to speak a little bit uh, fast because I know that we have limited <laughs> time here. Um, I mean, if I don't understand a word, I'll just ask you. Yeah, so please. Probably if I don't know it, then you probably also don't know it. So, okay, yeah. go back. <laughs> um, are they also watching? Let me maybe minimize this here. Yeah. And then move it to a corner where it doesn't interfere. Oh. Yeah, I just want to move it to the corner. Perfect. Okay. So I People might be thinking that I study all flies in the world, but that is not true. <laughs> I only study a group of flies. Um, that name that you see there is Estroidia flies. Estroidia. Oh my God, that was my favorite. It looks so big and fuzzy. Oh God, the one down there. Tachinity. Look, the one, one next to it. This one. Oh my God, it's that's like a big boy. <laughs> I love they that look one. like teddy bears. I know. They're fluffy I and cute. I must say, I gave my boyfriend a preview, and he was like, "Oh my gosh!" When you <laughs> learn, like, when you learn a little bit about the biology of these guys, mm -hmm. then you are not so. Um, you don't think they are teddy bears anymore. <laughs> I'll tell you about it later. Yes. Yeah. So these are some of the fly families uh, that I have included in the in the studies, um, but I actually focus uh, on this fly family here, Sarcophagidae. Mm -hmm. um, these flies, uh, you can find them um, everywhere, uh, but in all continents except for Antarctica. Mm -hmm. So they are very abundant everywhere. And some species of this family are forensically important. Another family that is famous for its forensic importance is this fly family mm -hmm. here. I'm sure you guys, when you walk your dog, in there oh. is always a fly that looks like this one, yes. steps in the poop, or <laughs> so they are very familiar yeah, yeah. to us. Because they're also because of the they're pretty shiny, huh? That yeah. is like greenish blue. Mm. When you see them in the collection, you can see the the super broad range of colors. Mm. It's not only green, they can be 
uh, like copper or, or copper blue. Mm. They're super nice flies. So some of these flies are very interesting and particularly because they have um, um, interesting biology. Mm -hmm. So they are relevant to all of us because they play different roles in the ecosystems of our planet. So uh, some of these flies, this is a fly. What? Yes, it is a fly. You probably won't believe because it looks like a spider. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but it is legs. <laughs> from a family called Mista Sinobide, And that family has only one species and it's the one you're looking at at the screen. So they live on the feces or guano uh, from bats. I was going to say that's a bat hat, huh? Exactly. But they do not parasite their larvae. Mm -hmm. So, but then we also, here is the teddy bears. And you see what they do. Yeah, oh. they parasite mammals. Oh, I don't like them anymore. I <laughs> like them. I like them. <laughs> they look so super cute. cute. <laughs> Under the microscope, they look super nice because uh -huh. they look really like teddy bears. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's super nice. Um, here we have some other flies, the tachinity, that are parasitoids of butterflies and moths. Um, here we have the califoridae, the ones that I said are forensically important. Mm -hmm. Here I put a picture of little chicks because these guys also lay larvae on small wounds yeah. or that uh, some mammals or small vertebrates uh, have on their bodies. So you will see animals with a little hole and you will see the larvae inside feeding on the live <laughs> animal. It's very impressive. Yeah. So <laughs> why I'm interested on my flies because all the habits I've mentioned for the other families are found in just one family, the sarcophagy. Oh. They do everything. <laughs> they do, they parasite uh, little uh, chicks and mm. they also parasite other insects. They go to uh, cattle dung. Mm. Uh, they also feed on human corpses. Mm. Um, so they are very interesting. So they are the major decomposers and recyclers of organic matter in all ecosystems. Uh, together with the Californity, I would say. Um, so they are forensically important. Um, and I, as a biologist, I am in these guys because they have a, lots of species which apparently ra radiated very recently in time. So they are models to understand mm -hmm. species diversification and evolution. So these are the topics that I, that I'm more interested in. These are the kind of questions I try to answer, mm -hmm. like how many fly species are there um, on Earth? Um, where is this fly diversity found? How these uh, forms of life relate one to another? That mm -hmm. is more or less evolution, phylogenetics. Mm -hmm. And also, I, or, yeah, I, I ask, um, can this biodiversity be modeled to make predictions about it? So these are the, the questions that interest me. And of course, everything I do start with collecting flies, mm -hmm. right? And um, I use several different methods to collect them. You can see me here collecting with an entomological net. Uh -huh. And here I'm using this trap that is called Van Sommer Riding Trap. Mm -hmm. uh, it has a plate here where I put dead uh, fish or oh, chicken like or bait. Dung. Exactly. Mm. I use a bait to attract these flies because they are attracted to decomposing mm -hmm. organic material. And then they get trapped in there? They can't exactly. get Exactly. Yeah. So when they fly, insects usually fly up mm -hmm. towards the light. So they get trapped in this tunnel here. Oh, I see. It's a net which has a zipper and then I put a glass with ethanol or there are other ways of preserve insects and I collect them. Mm -hmm. This is also for massive uh, collections. This is a Malay trap. There is one next to the museum. Have you seen it? No. Yeah, you can walk by um, that street when you go to Norbaut. In Validenstraße? Yeah. yeah. No, no, no. In Bali, just here, right next oh. to when you go to the Norbaut, there is some live trap right next to the museum. You can go there. Did you put this there? No, I didn't. I don't know who did it. <laughs> oh, cool. But, but there is one. Yeah, right cool. next oh, to our museum. <laughs> so, flies are everywhere. Mm. So, I go to many different places to collect flies understand uh, what are their roles in these different environments. Uh, I've been collecting in the United States, in Croatia, in Denmark, of course, mm -hmm. in Jamaica, with some students, um, Costa Rica, of course, Colombia. And you can see that the, the, 
that I've been collecting in very different environments. Sometimes yeah. it's open area, sometimes it's desertic area, sometimes it's a closed, very tight forest. Mm. Um, Vietnam was one of the last expeditions with our museum, that which was so wonderful. Pretty. And of course, Germany. Mm -hmm. um, but it happens that many of the insects we study are already in our collections. Mm -hmm. And many of the species we do not know uh, that live out there are also in our collections because someone collected them some time ago, mm -hmm. right? So this picture, for example, corresponds to a wasp that was described by one of the scientists here from the museum, Mihail Ohl. Dr. Mihail Ohl found a species in the collection and this uh, wasp was collected many years before he studied it. And it's interesting that we are sometimes so focused on going outside to the field while we have great resources to study in our collections. Mm. But there is this principle that called the, well, people call it taxonomic impediment. It's, it means more or less, we have too many species to describe and too little time, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. What I'm showing here is, a, is an insect bird. So you see flies pinned there maybe, but in this museum, we do not have one drawer. The picture is more like this, <laughs> yeah. right? We have many, many of them. Uh -huh, uh -huh. And like me, it's not a specialist on any insect or any fly. Mm -hmm. I study a one, just one family. Mm -hmm. But insects are super diverse. So yes. imagine all the huge uh, group, large group of scientists that we would need to describe what we have in mm -hmm. museums is a huge task. And when we think about museums in general in the world, the amount of objects, including insects, but also mammals and fungi and plants mm. in museums is amazing. Our museum has 30 million objects, but there are other institutions that have many more or much less. But what I'm trying to show here is that as a scientific field, we are overwhelmed by the huge task we have in front of us uh -huh. that is describing all this biodiversity. If we just describe biodiversity from museums, this is the task we have to deal with. These are the numbers. Aye, aye. So how can we do this task faster? Um, so my solution is more data, mm -hmm. better data and better data integration. So imagine that you go out to the field and you are collecting lots of different data. You know that you collected a particular fly that belongs to a particular species. Uh, it is an adult. It's not a, um, any species, but one particular species that lives in one particular habitat that only fits on one particular plant. And you collected it in a place that has some specific geographic coordinates, mm -hmm. specific elevation, specific country. So all the information we collect belongs, belo uh, becomes like ah. dots, oh, yeah, right? Yeah. Flies also carry lots of information. Mm -hmm. Their taxonomy, their species identification, their genetics, their anatomy uh, is different and we can extract information from all these different morphologies and anatomies. And we preserve them in museums where we also extract this information depending on which method of mm -hmm. preservation you use, you can access to, to a particular kind of data or not. So the way we preserve insects in this museum allow us to study genetics, anatomy, uh, biogeography, mm -hmm. many different things because we collect lots of data, right? So what I'm showing here, for example, is that different um, preservation methods allow you, for example, to study DNA, mm -hmm. right? So most of the species that are in our collections, insect species were preserved dry on a pin, mm -hmm. right? Uh, but some uh, other methods also exist and we use them. Like, for example, we preserve insects in ethanol. Sometimes we also use liquid nitrogen. You too at the museum? Um, just in general? In general, in general. I would say. Okay. Uh, but in this museum, we have also cryobanks and we keep specimens in freezers that are like minus 80, minus mm. 20, minus 40 to preserve DNA, right? DNA is a great tool to understand mm -hmm. biodiversity, to understand um, how to, to use it as a tool for species identification, for example. So all this information needs to be better integrated 
right? All the taxonomic identifications, collecting data. Uh, if I'm talking about a type or a paratype, do you know what it is? Type you mm -hmm. describe species, right? So that specimen, let's say, is the name carrier, mm -hmm. right? Is the like lucky guy, type, right? Yeah, exactly. Okay. So we have this specimen are very, very special to science in our museum, and one of the things we do with them is digitize them. Mm -hmm. So what I'm talking about here is also digitization. When mm -hmm. I talk about data, is data that we preserve in databases. Sometimes these databases are connected and mm -hmm. talk to one another. Mm -hmm. Times they don't. So we need better integration of this database that whenever I go to the portal of, let's say, pieces I collected in Vietnam in 2018, mm -hmm. I can see not only what, what species, but I can also go to a link that takes me to the genetic mm -hmm. uh, sequence that was extracted from that specimen, and I can also see a map where this species has been collected. Mm -hmm. So all this integration of data we believe will uh, accelerate species mm -hmm. discovery, but also that we understand not only to put a name species, not, not, not only to describe them, but to understand their role in ecosystems, right? That's what mm -hmm. we want to do, ultimately. So until now, we have said that some biodiversity has been collected and is in our museum, but mm -hmm. we have this taxonomic impediment, right? Too many species, too little time. So. One of the tools I use to accelerate species discovery, but also to understand how species evolve, how these flies evolve, is um, genomics. Using the DNA that I extract from specimens from our museum to understand their evolution. So there is a, a technology called, wait, I don't know if I'm doing something here. Oops. There you go. Okay. Um, so next generation sequencing methods, and this is going to be a little bit technical for those who are not scientists, but I'll try to explain uh, mm -hmm. in the easiest possible way. So with these new technologies, uh, called, including next generation sequencing, we can use genetic material from specimens that were collected 100 years ago extracted this DNA from dry specimens and use it to reconstruct their evolution. So there are some methods that I'm mentioning here, H, A, 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 A H, A, E, sorry, <laughs> anchor hybrid enrichment and ultra conserved elements. These are just two methods that we have used um, to understand evolution of these flies. I, today I'm going to show a little bit of uh, my research mm -hmm. using ultra conserved, ultra conserved elements. Um, and I would like to explain a little bit what these DNA elements are. Mm -hmm. They are ultra conserved DNA sequences that we can find in any genome of any organism. So because they are ultra conserved, you can track them across distantly related organisms. And maybe someone wondering, okay, but if they are ultra conserved, let's remember Darwin, evolution studies variation. Mm -hmm. So if everything of all these ultra conserved elements look the same, where is the variation that I'm mm -hmm. going to study to understand evolution? Well, it happens that these UCs have a very conserved area in their central part, in their core, but their flanking areas are, ha are super varied. So the DNA that is around uh, flanking these ultra conserved elements is very variable and we can use it to reconstruct evolution. So you, can, you have to do lots of lab work to use these methods. Mm -hmm. um, in this I'm going to show, I sequence a genome of these species that I'm showing here, sarcophaga crassipathies, and I also sequence the transcriptome. The transcriptome is the RNAs that you find at a particular time, at a particular um, I use, uh, I design some props to amplify these uh, DNA materials, and then I reconstruct the of these flies that I showed you in the first slide. Mm -hmm. So they are here, all of them, but I'm not going to focus on the results I got from the biological point of view, but I would like to focus on our collections. Mm -hmm. And what is important in this study is that 35% of the samples I used were 
museum specimens. Mm -hmm. And this little number here means a lot because some of the specimens were collected 126 years ago. Sorry. Yeah, yeah. 80% of them um, were successful during the enrichment. This is a particular process we do in Dura. That means that we were able to use our DNA, all DNA preserved in dry specimens that someone collected 100 years ago. So our collections in, the, in our museum are a treasure. I mean, our, mm. our drawers, all the specimens we have here, is a great treasure, it's a source of biological tissues to perform studies like the one I'm showing, uh, but also many other things. So I would like to highlight that. We mm -hmm. have really a lot of information, a lot of specimens to study in our collections. And no one would believe that DNA can be preserved for so many years. But the technologies we have access to these days allow us to use mm -hmm. these small traces of DNA that are in these specimens. Another study that I'm going to show today very quickly is, a, is, is an ongoing study yeah. that is being carried mm. out in Berlin. Nice. <laughs> so for you Berliners, we also are studying flies in Berlin. So what for those who are not from Germany, they probably don't recognize this map, but this is the map of Berlin. Mm -hmm. And there are some areas highlighted in green. These are very large parks, mm -hmm. city parks or natural parks around Berlin. And what we wanted to do was using flies to sample wildlife diversity. And you probably are wondering like, how I'm mm -hmm. going to know, for example, how many foxes, fox species are out there yeah. with a fly? Well, it is Hello. possible <laughs> because these flies, they interact with many different animals, many mm -hmm. different vertebrates. As soon as they step on an animal, and they get in contact with the secretions of this animal, let's say tears mm. or poop, or just on the skin, they are sort of vectors of DNA. They collect pieces of DNA mm -hmm. on their bodies. So when you sequence, when you take a fly from a Berlin park and take it to the lab, you amplify study all the DNAs that are on the body of the fly. Mm -hmm. you, can fly not on, you can find not only So, um, want because of course, and I'm indicating here, we know that in Berlin parks are dogs. Yeah, and of yeah. course, people walk dogs, and yeah, we know yeah. that there are also humans. Mm -hmm. So we don't want to learn about the DNA of these yeah, it matter because it is not interesting to us. But mm -hmm. what we want to study is, or we want to discover this wildlife in uh, that is in Berlin parks and some diversity that we don't know is out there because sometimes when biologists go to these parks and they try to observe these animals mm -hmm. they are very shy they don't see them but in using this method we are discovering a huge diversity we didn't know it was out there so for example in these localities around Berlin we found animals that you didn't know are out there Oh, yeah. Foxes, other exactly. I didn't know that. So what this is telling us is Berlin parks also operate as a place where diversity, biodiversity can be maintained. Mm. So these parks are important to maintain diversity. Even if we don't see the foxes out there, they are there, yeah, yeah. right? And with these flies, we are able to, uh, to know that they are there. Also, we, we were able to identify some fly, some bird species out there, and also some other small animals. Yeah. These are just my results. This is, I'm not going to emphasize on this, but with that, I just wanted to tell Berliners that your parks are yeah. very, very biodiverse and are interesting places both for you guys because you enjoy the outdoors, trees, and mm -hmm. green areas, but is it is also an interesting place uh, we can find both insect diversity and wildlife mm -hmm. diversity. So protect them. And thank you very much uh, yeah. in advance, <laughs> Francisca and Laura. Who's right, are, right over there. <laughs> over there, yeah. And thanks to my colleagues that have been supporting. These are the institutions that have supported my, my research. And with that, I stop sharing.
Very yeah. cool. Yeah. Just click stop it. Yeah. Perfect. Really cool. I already have. I already have some questions. I see there is one in the chat, but I have. Okay. I have Sorry if I went one. too long. <laughs> no, no, not at, not at all. My first question already is: if you um, look at what kind of animals you find in a region, right? That um, does that mean that flies always stay in the same area? Like, does a fly sometimes fly from Potsdam to you know? I don't know, Magdeburg? <laughs> they can, <laughs> but they can fly uh, very, very large distances. Mm -hmm. um, some of them are better flyers than others, and some of them are more dependent on certain resources that I are see. in particular places. Okay. So ranges of distributions of some species are wider and broader mm. than others. So the species I showed, the fly I for which I sequence a genome, mm -hmm. Cofaga crassipalpis, is a fly that has a very, very wide range of distribution. Not that the same fly goes, let's say, from Washington all the way to LA, yeah. <laughs> but their populations extend all over these mm -hmm. areas, right? But they can fly quite long distances. Okay. Good to know, because I, that's actually something I never thought about, but really, like, that matters, right, yeah. if you do research. Cool, maybe we should look at the at the chat. Okay, I go here. Someone says, uh, congrats, interesting work. <laughs> I do think it's interesting work too, I must say. It's Thanks. really cool. Um, because I've never really actually thought much about flies, but there's so much you can learn from them. Because I right, I studied vertebrates and yeah. then longer life. Yeah. I know you're also um uh specimen that are obviously no longer alive because they're in the collection, but stuff that's already a very because we both I mean, I'm yeah. sure out there and to be studied and yeah. to be included in studies and it is one of the and understood mm -hmm. and used in conservation purpose and all these mm -hmm. things. Yeah. Okay, so if you have um, questions from um, Marta, actually. When you find a fly with fox DNA in a park in Berlin, how do you know the fox found somewhere in Brandenburg? So the fly was found in Berlin, the DNA. How do you know it wasn't fox? That's an interesting question, which yeah. I cannot answer. <laughs> um, I work in collaboration, um, I, I should have said this, um, this is a work in collaboration with uh, Dr. Camilla Mazzoni from the, um, uh, from the Wildlife Institute mm -hmm. here in Berlin. They are probably the ones to, uh, that know more the details on how okay. you estimate presence or absence of a particular species in mm -hmm. a particular place. And you, not to imagine also that the fox, the fox was somewhere else uh, mm -hmm. or the fly was somewhere else and they got in contact somewhere else, but not in that part. Yeah, yeah. But we collect the flies in very, very short periods of time. These flies cannot fly from very far away. So we set the traps for only, um, we, we, lay, lay, we lay them, I don't know, we, we put them out there for, between five minutes and 30 minutes is usually never that 30 short? minutes. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. Only for a very, very short period of time. Yeah, yeah. So it's very, very hard that we get a fly from very, very far away. Yes. Okay. The flies are just there. And that is why we designed the experiment this way. Mm. Uh, I might probably be wrong in the times we are actually using right now because we are adjusting the method. Every year we do this same experiment mm -hmm. in summer. We did it this year as well. So we are modifying uh, the, the method, uh, especially time-wise, mm -hmm. because of these questions that one can I see, okay. Find. Yeah. I think that's what, that, that also is a little bit to the question I had where I'm like, how far can flies fly, you know, how do you know? But if you only set it for a short time and um, your colleagues probably know more about the foxes, <laughs> yeah. for example, or like the badgers or... Yeah, exactly, they yeah, know yeah. about vertebrate biodiversity. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> But we know that the flies were there in a very, in a very, very short period that we collected them. Mm -hmm. So they were there when we collected them. Okay. Yeah. So um, 
please feel free to ask more questions and we can see if we can answer them. But in the meantime, I have some of my own. Just again, I want to know all the things, so I hope it's okay. <laughs> um, you talked about how you, I can never pronounce this correctly, digital, digitalized something new, like digitalize everything. Or Wow. Is it done? Can you tell us a little bit more about that? More now mm -hmm. because of the corona than ever. Yeah, right? yeah. This is not a process that started during the pandemic. We've been in this for quite a long time. Mm -hmm. So um the museum has been developing tools and stations to digitize insects, but also snails, all sort of organisms we have mm -hmm. in our collections. Um, of course, during the pandemic, these digital resources are more important than mm -hmm. ever because then you can access them from as a biologist to explore our collections. Probably they haven't seen them. Yeah, yeah, because what what we see when we come to the museum is the exhibits right mm -hmm. the exhibitions with the big dinosaurs and everything but these ex uh, exhibitions we have super large collections mm -hmm. so digitize them is a is a priority right now at the museum we actually have and i invite everyone looking at us uh, to come to the museum because we have a whole room where we digitize specific can see how we do oh, this yeah. digitization right next to the main right? exactly mm -hmm. so there are uh, photograph stations where it's very funny because there is like a platform and insects go and roll over a platform and then they pass through a tunnel of cameras and they are photographed from all angles uh -huh. so you can also get 3d images for example uh, you get images from the labels mm -hmm. then the idea is to digitize the label information from the specimens because in the labels is where you find the collector locality, mm -hmm. who collected it, how, on which host or substrate. So the information of labels is extremely important. So we also want to digitize that. Mm -hmm. Um, eventually, we hope we can use some artificial intelligence to read the labels so we don't need humans trying oh, to yeah. figure out what's written what is, on the labels. Oh God, the, the amount of time I spent on writing, reading all the labels where I'm like, what is this? It's cursive, always cursive. Exactly. Oh God. <laughs> yeah, but labels today are printed yeah. in different letters that we can actually understand and that mm. computers can read. Yeah. But many of the very interesting specimens are still on, we oh, yeah. on, with this old ink there, so. it's like oh, yeah I'm, I'm, yeah that sometimes fades away you of course even yeah read it's the same them. with dinosaur stuff you know because always like collected yeah. 1900s eight or whatever and oh but, god yeah but yes. digitization is is here to stay for sure mm -hmm. and it is not new yeah uh, it's been developed uh, the museum had a, a a program that used to take photos of the whole drawer mm -hmm. so People would go to the website of the museum and explore the collection and they would see a photo of the whole box with the pin insects on them. This was interesting for some researchers that w just wanted to get an idea mm -hmm. of the specimens we have. But for scientific purposes, mm -hmm. because you can't really, even if you zoom in maximum zoom, yeah, I don't you see can't stuff. see the Right? Yeah. But it is a way of digitizing collections. We did that for many years, mm -hmm. but now we are most um, to put efforts in specimen based digitization. Yeah, yeah. Right? And I must say, like, I um, during my mass, I had a photogrammy. Photogrammy? It's where you, you, can, you can basically download your own program and take pictures of a specimen from different angles and make your own 3D models basically at home. I've seen that. So that's something that they teach at, well, teach at school now. Yeah. And that was really cool. Someone from the museum actually taught it. So <laughs> I bet I was uh, at the ah, university. Yeah. So um, kind of teaching young researchers already uh -huh. how important it can be to have that, you know, digitally on yeah. your computer because um, 
what sometimes people don't know is we don't always work with the specimen in front of us, right? Like when I did research, I sat at the computer all day looking at like CT scans yeah. and stuff. I have the bones right there. Just look at my computer. I um, guess it's, it's the idea of biologists or paleontologists mm -hmm. working on the real specimen is very romanticized. Yes. Somehow like I'm looking at the fly well <laughs> sometimes we don't want to touch the flies because they are very mm -hmm. fragile mm -hmm, mm -hmm. if they were collected 200 years ago yeah. they are super <laughs> and they fall apart yeah, yeah, yeah. so we need to preserve digitization mm -hmm. is also a way of preserving information all over the world yeah to understand learn from these specimens learn from how they were identified what we know about them it is very, it is a great tool, I would mm -hmm. say. Yeah, I agree. <laughs> we have a question from YouTube that Laura kindly posted here. Um, it says, as we know that the population of insect species is at a decline, what are the steps taken by the museum in advising the government towards saving them? Do you know anything about that? Wow. That is a really true. good yeah, deep is question. A... Wow. <laughs> so, I know that uh, my colleagues from the museum, um, especially those that uh, deal with public relations, mm -hmm. they are in constant conversations with the government uh, trying to uh, create stronger um, bones that also help the government to understand why mm -hmm. we should invest in uh, research, in biodiversity research, uh, how we should do it, mm -hmm. why, what are our plans and the approach that from the museum we want to use and um, for and that's also that's that has a connection with my work with molecular uh, data because we want to show that as a museum we have the capacity and the experience to discover diversity before it disappears mm -hmm. with very very cutting edge so we are in some conversations with the government to uh, have a better understanding of what we do and why is it important uh, to and uh, this process to happen but it's going to happen without with or without us but mm -hmm. we need to to um speed up our yeah. our work as scientists i also think that's why education is so important because if you uh, actually know what's going on behind the scenes they care you know i had um when people were they would come and they would approach me because I'm the organizer. And then I was like, we had no idea there's actual like research done here. We thought this is just, you know, basically <laughs> they didn't say it like that, but a dumping ground for fossils, kind of like you come yeah. and look at the fossils. Not everybody thinks about what's done upstairs or yeah. in the basement. And people just get so excited when they learn what's actually done and then they go home and maybe people about it or they read more about it and like if that is something that we as scientists can help yeah. with to make people care or maybe be curious or pass that on to other family members or people yeah. that talk to an educated um, public also makes good good decisions and also yeah. um, return also um, what happens yeah. we will <laughs> and um, I think it's all like really important that scientists talk to the government, also that the public is involved, right? Because they are also decision makers, which yeah. is something I think they sometimes forget. They also have the influence to. Yeah, decide. but I think these platforms that we are using mm -hmm. right now, where we talk to other scientists, but to a society at large, is really a great opportunity to talk directly and to show how we do our work and mm -hmm. why we as scientists really believe it is essential mm -hmm. um, and i really agree with you that science communication is really rich we didn't have before mm -hmm. because i have to say years ago scientists wrote exactly right yeah, yeah. and we need to create that bridge to be able to communicate to the society we're looking for, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Uh, the government in Berlin has supported this museum in a great way. And yeah. We are super thankful, of course, you know, the mm -hmm. huge grant we got. In yeah. uh, one of the, 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 the goals of, uh, of this big project was the digitization, and mm -hmm. it is the digitization. We are working on it. And 
it is also related to, to the development of new tools of describing biodiversity in a faster way. And for, in the center where I work, we also try to do that to complement digitization or not to complement maybe, but to accelerate species uh, discovery in the field. Mm -hmm. So we go out to the field, we collect uh, specimens, are, we are uh, implementing, implementing new methods that will accelerate some of the most tedious tasks that we do as scientists, at least as entomologists, that is sorting material. Mm -hmm. So we come back from the field with these big jars full of insects we cannot see through the alcohol because it's packed with insects <laughs> and then you spend hours and hours sorting these specimens where there are no tools mm -hmm. molecular tools that speed up this process so the scientists in the end get only the 20 species morphotypes whatever you want to call them that were collected in this particular place mm -hmm. in this particular time so we are combining all the modern tools we have at hand in this museum to to learn from uh, to learn and understand this uh, biodiversity before it is lost mm -hmm. <laughs> asking wait actually two more no one more okay let me see there's the chat um i think many evolutionary scientists use trans Cryptomics yeah. to samples. Do you know anyone doing that? Do you think provide more information? Well, transcriptomics it is 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 a method where you. Well, I'm explaining this for the public mm -hmm. because they, um, where you sequence a, a molecule uh, that we have in our cells that is our this is the expressed uh, right that eventually is uh, translated into a protein so transcriptomes are informative of what is going on in our cells which genes are mm -hmm. being expressed right now mm -hmm. in this particular tissue right in this particular moment of development of this organism so it is a technique that can help uh, understanding how genes express and some of my colleagues have also used transcriptomes to reconstruct uh, the evolution of uh, flies, actually. Um, I do not have any information of transcriptomes being used as a tool for biodiversity discovery, if mm -hmm. that was the question. Um, can you provide more information? I don't know if it's about biodiversity or about the specimen you work with. Uh, Mm. But yeah, people that do it. So, but yeah. yeah, but for, uh, for phylogenetics, mm -hmm. right? To reconstruct the phylogenetic relation flies, mm -hmm. but also other organisms. Uh, but uh, I'm not sure if this is uh, the answer for that person. If there is, if there is um, a question, please. Ah, can put, I can I cannot pronounce this word. Put her, Proteomics? How do you pronounce this properly? Proteomics. Proteomics. Provide more information. I think you already touched on that because it gives more of an insight what happens right here in a certain place. Right? Yeah, proteomics for those. <laughs> it's, it is more or less the study of the yeah, proteins or RNAs that have been transcribed into proteins in a particular cell. Um, I don't, I mean, normally when we uh, run this phylogenetic analysis we usually analyze dna mm -hmm. right but we can also translate these dna sequences into proteins mm -hmm. to reconstruct phylogenetic relationships and um, i wouldn't call this proteomics and um, this is just the translation of the dna um, yeah okay all right keep those questions coming they're really uh, like really good yeah Sorry. I think that there is a scientific audience out there. I think so too, yeah. We um, I have a few more things that, that I'm also interested in. You want to um, You talk how you work on specimen that you have a collection that might no longer exist in the wild. Yeah. Um, do, you, do you and your coworkers have like an approximate number of how many you discovered in the collections that are no longer out there? 
or you find some in the collection you're like oh my god this has been wiped out for like 50 years like is that I you am very sure that there are many specimens in collections that is not they but super hard um, to collect and with the insect decline we are mm -hmm. in these days there will be more okay for sure so ongoing thing where you yeah. have more and more of this yeah. happening okay um then yeah. i have okay, so oh. oh cool there's um Laura wants you guys to do a survey as well about the event. So if you have some time, let okay. us know. That's the survey link so people can tell us um, uh, how they got on with the Zoom and how they like the talk and stuff. So please do it. <laughs> I was going to say, I'm sorry, I have, I have my own question still. Um, there's something that I personally find interesting to ask. What is the best thing about your work and what is the worst? I think you already said the most tedious thing is... <laughs> sorting through the collection <laughs> but let, maybe let's start with what is your very favorite thing about your job I didn't think of an answer for that question <laughs> I I love uh, to be able to I love the moment of discovery right yeah when you run I mean this study I showed uh, was based on 2,500 genes. I mean, mm -hmm. 10 years ago, we were not able to do these things. So I'm very proud of these things. But when you run this analysis and you are trying to understand if the particular genes you selected will be able to reconstruct the evolution of a huge group of flies, mm -hmm. so diverse, so different, that moment, that excitement you have when you are running this analysis and finding out the result is very, very nice. It's, mm -hmm. it's, the, it's the best moment, I would say. Um, writing the papers and all this is more like a communication task, right? We have to write our science and sheet. But before, the best step, I would say, is when we are in the process of the Mm -hmm. that is amazing I really like that mm -hmm. also when I when I'm sorting five <laughs> and you find a specimen that is it shouldn't be in this location mm -hmm. here or is it a known species uh, these mm -hmm. moments where you're wondering about some particular sample you have also it can be tedious yeah. as I said <laughs> it's a love hate thing yeah, yeah. <laughs> but it is also exciting yeah nice yeah the, the the sense of like the discovery i agree yeah that is is i think that's that makes it worth it i think that's why people stick yeah to science when they're you know if they're it, that's that, that's like the hook right it's a blind scientific blind date yeah you, know, you, you don't know where you're <laughs> you going don't know to what you're going to get <laughs> <laughs> um also i mean the current situation has probably affected all of us like i have friends also in, in the us especially who lost their jobs because you know museums are yeah. cutting back um we are lucky we still have yeah what we have but um how has it changed your li life here at the museum did it um because i know to the collection or borrow stuff like is that still happening or is it just completely out of question yeah, I'm, I'm usually very sad for those PhD students, researchers who depend on the collections mm -hmm. for their, for getting their results, species and all these dogs. So the more affected, those running experiments and they couldn't come to the museum in time to see the results before the animal died or something mm -hmm, like mm -hmm. that. And the universities. Uh, so um, this, that, that is probably the... Um, for me, it is, it's been a time where I could retreat <laughs> to my desk at home mm -hmm. and do some tasks without interruptions that I don't get to do sometimes yeah, here. Yeah. We have many meetings daily, uh, physic, I mean, before the pandemic, of course, these were meetings, mm -hmm. uh, physical meetings where we meet real people. Um, and sometimes that is uh, distracting. Um, so working from home was very, very efficient from my side. Mm -hmm. I really enjoyed it, I mm -hmm. have to say. 
Um, I have a small office at home. I have a stereoscope. I have my computer. Oh, nice. I can connect to the servers where I run the supercomputers where I run uh -huh. my analysis. So I didn't feel very limited. Okay. Um, I was also, I took uh, flies home. <laughs> Actually, <laughs> I described four species during the pandemic. No. Yeah. <laughs> so cool. it was quite efficient. Yeah. I even took photos of these flies. I mean, normally we use very sophisticated uh, photographic mm. equipment here in the museum to make these fantastic photos. But I was at home, so I used this phone <laughs> to take the photos through the microscope and I submitted a paper with these photos. The paper was recently accepted um, for publication. Mm -hmm. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> and so I, I managed to do a lot mm -hmm. uh, from, from home. So I'm very happy that, that I managed. But I also know of some other colleagues who have a place to work at home. Yeah. Also they their families, do right? And office or exactly in Germany that work life balance is something that is encouraged. Yeah. You don't have a big place to work at home sometimes no. because you don't work at home. You have fun. Yeah. You be with your family. You watch I understand that very hard mm -hmm. during these months. Um, it was not my case, but it doesn't mean to of what course, yeah. other people experienced. Um, I missed the museum, I missed the collection, mm -hmm. I missed my colleagues. Mm -hmm. um, I, I, I admit that Zoom and all these tools are very useful these days, uh, but this human uh, I know. thing, yeah, yeah. Is, it is special. Yeah. And it, I would say that in the future, I hope that every organization has the option so people can work from home mm -hmm. whenever they want. Also, keep a place where people can meet and yeah. have this uh, interaction that is so, so essential for, for us. I think this is my first time in like seven months that I've come. It's my I've, first time. Yeah. yeah it's, <laughs> Because I used to do it um, this this event the, right at the um, called experiment here mm -hmm. um, experiment with lots of people here. yeah and um, then suddenly it said no you can't come here anymore and it's like oh my god how's it going to happen and I was so happy yeah. that everything um, was manageable in um, in this way we have these but today to come into the I'm back. <laughs> you understand <laughs> yeah we also i mean the museum does their best to yeah uh, give us a good working space mm -hmm. and and that of course cannot be replaced at home I also think. i mean you guys can see how how big this whole like this is what be like a tenth of this room of this space is huge so yeah. there's a lot of um, ways to also not be super close together it's Probably also get the echo. That Maybe can a little bit. <laughs> help you to imagine the size yeah, of this. It's on also, of course, incredibly. Question from YouTube. Um, Maybe let's answer that. Um, do flies also involve in controlling the population of an animal by spreading disease? How important is it in population control? So flies spreading disease to an animal, let's say like a fox or something. Yeah. Is that something that happens? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Flies are vectors of mm -hmm. many parasites, viruses. Um, they spread bacteria because they are in contact with mm -hmm. dead things. Um, if we think about mosquitoes, which are also flies, um, well, they are the deadliest uh, predator yeah. of humans. Yeah. No? Mm -hmm. uh, they spread malaria among other diseases mm -hmm. like chikungunya, Zika, uh, yellow fever. Um, so they are um, they are extremely important as a, I mean, th there are books that actually tell that they kind of control populations in populations during the wars where we didn't have uh, vaccines mm -hmm. or medicines to treat these illnesses. And those who fought those wars or we went, or went to these battles, Places where these diseases didn't exist. So they were uh, exposed to things they were not exposed before. Um, so for sure, yeah, it's a huge problem for us. I'm 
say they control human but more than I would say, um, let me see, I have the numbers here. Um, if I'm, I might be wrong number, but 800,000 people die every year because of malaria. Yeah, I believe it. I had a, had a class where we also talked about, we saw kind of like a, a graph about how many um, people die from malaria and how many people die from being attacked by ish. And it shock was like this much in malaria. No, I actually, was it, I'm a big fa fan of, I think yesterday was it that I, that I listened to a podcast where they were talking about numbers, mm -hmm. about like deadliest predators on earth and mosquitoes were top, number one. And then I think number 10 or even lower were like uh, crocodiles mm -hmm. with maybe um, hippos, hippos are hundred deaths a year uh -huh. and sharks were so low, yeah, yeah, yeah. hippos. The elephant a hundred and crocodiles had, had a thousand. Okay. It's really, I mean, we are billions of humans. It's really a very small number. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Wow. Yeah, no, that's, yeah. Malaria, like even if you, my parents went to Kenya and they had to take like malaria pills and they come with their own kind of side effects. Um, I had a, a friend that did like field work in i don't know if it was tanzania or i don't want to say a wrong country but it was definitely like in rural africa somewhere and they said that the medication they took was so bad that people on the team would rather risk to get malaria because okay. people got, got like paranoia they started seeing things they got violently sick and they were like i'd rather have malaria then take these pills anymore. So I think um, depending on the kind of medication you take, yeah. because I got some for the Caribbean ages ago because my parents were like, there's some malaria there, let's do it. No side effects at all because it's also different pills you take. Uh -huh. But the ones they had to take were really, really bad. My parents also got like yellow fever vaccination, got super sick from that. And okay. yeah, <laughs> so this comes with the own problem <laughs> with, you know, you're exposed like you said like yes yeah. we have all tools that prevent us getting sick but they can also be you know, yeah. not be great here at the museum when we have to go to the field uh, we are vaccinated against everything i have yeah. vaccines one else has <laughs> probably <laughs> uh, and i never had any important side effect on the pills mm -hmm. or any other Yes, mm. it is different from person to person. I was lucky. Yeah, maybe. I went to Northern Thailand where they have Japanese encephalitis mm -hmm. and I got vaccination for that. Yeah. And they said, oh, don't work out. Don't drink anything. And I was like, that's of course, of course not. Like, I'm, I know I'm getting vaccinated. It's yeah. fine. And then I had one glue vine with a friend and I had such a bad headache for uh. like a day after because they said, don't drink. And I did. <laughs> How large was the, that glue wine one? Oh, it was took? just like, like a, like a <laughs> normal glue wine. Yeah. Maybe it has had an extra <laughs> shot of amaretto, I don't remember. But it's a, my, my lesson. Know. Yeah, it didn't work out though. So <laughs> I did not think correct. But it's funny now that we talk about malaria and mosquitoes because um, I didn't know, I mean, why mosquitoes bite some people and not other people yeah they, why they choose some and some others is still not very clear in mm -hmm. science it, I, mean, I was thinking about uh, when i when i went to the doctor uh, last time we went to the, that was vietnam and mm -hmm. um, the doctor told me like a funny comment like yeah you usually go with these stinky shoes in the out in the field and we go walk in the mud yeah. and, and we get sweaty and muddy. Uh, she said, yeah, you are classic tired oh. because apparently uh, stinky shoes, stinky ears attract mosquitoes. Stinky ears? Yeah. <laughs> Good to know. <laughs> yeah, so clean your ears. Well, I'm talking Whenever. today. <laughs> yeah. Uh, um, I have one more question, and then um, we'll see. We'll see if we finish our coffee. Um, I wrote down, which advice would you give a young researcher or who thinks about becoming a scientist, a scientist um, about how to get started, or maybe they think 
he has already been discovered. Why should I, or how can I be a scientist and actually do something great? How do I start? Do you have a little bit of advice? Um, yeah, well, I will first talk to the, to the young ones who do not know uh, how, to, how to start. Mm -hmm. um, I would say that everything which is wrong, everything. Mm -hmm. Well, guys, I'm telling you that we have described 1.1 or 1.2 species of insects and out there is 30 million to be described. So no, <laughs> not <laughs> everything work. <laughs> has been described yeah. or discovered. And I am very sure that this could apply to many other scientific fields mm -hmm. where there is a lot of uh, work to be done. So do not believe that everything is uh, already studied. Uh, as soon as you start going deeper into a field, you realize that there is a lot of mm -hmm. uh, work to do. Uh, so first uh, that, and then, um, especially to the girls, uh, I would like to say that um, science is also a place for us. Uh, it is uh, becoming more and more interest, interesting uh, for, for us. Um, our work is supported. There is place for everyone here. And you never, never believe that because you take a science course at a and you are the only girl that doesn't mean you are alone that mm. means that you are a pioneer so stay there stay there because you are conquering some that is super important um, first of all it's our own needs i would say. so at pioneering you be uh, considering yourself self-esteem confidence that for because you thought the only one mm -hmm. could take that maybe um, and then by learning things, you will be inspired by scientists. Science is an amazing place where you find people. So yeah. if you don't find inspiration right around you, go to museums, go talk mm -hmm. to people. Usually scientists are open to talk and to tell what they do, what we do. Mm -hmm. And that could be a source of inspiration. Our museum has several events where public is invited, not only these digital uh, events that we are ha um, having now because of Corona, but physically we usually have several events where people is invited to find inspiration. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and I think Berlin is also um, really a good space to be a female or a woman scientist. Um, there are lots of events happening I think the museum does a lot, but there are also um, other organizations, right? like um, we have someone from uh, science here, where um, basically like scientists talk about their research to the public because outdoors mm -hmm. it's in, in front of just even in a museum or university, it's like near central station, like oh, yeah. <laughs> like, like the, the normal public will just walk by and like, run into science. You know? It's like it's a cool cool idea because it's something that um there's so many cool agents out there that promote women in science and there's definitely definitely it's more and more promoted mm -hmm. and um I think I'm really happy about that because I also know what it's like when I started geology. Um there were not 50-50 men and women but definitely more men. But then I specialized in paleontology and I was the only woman yeah. or I was the only girl even at the time like I was <laughs> still so much younger and on campus I was known as that dinosaur girl because I was the only, the only one girl. they were like are you that like that one girl <laughs> that does paleontology and things are changing and um, I, I um, was to that faculty to give um, communication or what you can do with a geology degree and there were so many women in the call and asking questions and I was so happy because in, I didn't feel like a pioneer you know I felt good about where I was but at the same time it was weird standing out at first because my I didn't have much um, self-esteem this as maybe have now that I'm more experienced I was like oh my god everybody knows 
<laughs> but honestly, that's not true. We're just really excited, you know? They were yeah. excited for me and they asked questions and that actually still happens. If I go to a party, they're like, oh, dinosaurs, can you tell me about that? <laughs> and I think um, that is just, it's exciting. And I think um, being the only one doesn't mean it's wrong. It just means you yeah. know what's best and what's cool. <laughs> <laughs> you, yeah, I think um, you yeah. said that real well, really well, you're a pioneer. And the way, I, I really like how you said that, really. Yeah. I, the, to, to describe it like that just gives you in, a great feeling. I was like, oh, wow, yeah, I feel really good now about hearing this. But we, we need to do these yeah. things when we, when we have this insecurity and we are in places we have never been mm -hmm. and we do not know that the others, others they also had the first time at some yeah. point, maybe not anymore because yeah. they are senior scientists or something like that. But it does mean that for them is comfortable. We all are these things. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I, you, when you were mentioning, when you were talking about you and how you felt a little bit. Um, In the spotlight. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, I thought about this uh, imposter syndrome that we yeah. constantly, constantly see on the media and, and it is there really. Yeah. And it is not only uh, the women that suffer from these things. Hmm. Because we are all thinking that we are the only ones that do not know something. No. No more you know that you don't. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. So I, I like the what I like of senior scientists, for example, is sense of tranquility because they know that they don't know everything. Mm -hmm. And they they receive your questions with just yeah, I know. I own yeah, it's it's yeah. super nice, right? Yeah, but when we are in this moment of the best, we are in a moment where we are expected to deliver science. Mm -hmm. You need to know things. You need you to need show know everything. You know, All the facts. Right? Yeah, yeah. So, no, I don't, yeah. <laughs> no, I don't know. Come on, yeah. come on to this museum. There's a lot of yeah. we don't. I have a little bonus question that uh, I thought of, and I don't know if it fits it. it but I want to ask it anyway. You talked about um, you um, studied Colombia, and obviously, um, when you hear, but also, you know, you, you think of other things too, but that's something you do think about. Yeah. When you started out as a young woman, were you ever discouraged from joining that career because it might be dangerous or did you ever feel like this is a dangerous job as a woman or were you just like no this is great this is interesting and i want to do that and saw the crimes it's cool you know <laughs> kind of like you know that's the idea you had right um did you ever in the in the back of your head not just only being a woman scientist but also that field that you're interested in that, that could be problematic mm, yes yeah yeah i did mm, in not only in colombia but i've heard stories from other places where forensic scientists get letters from people in prison mm. and they get uh, letters where they threaten them or mm -hmm. how, threat them, threaten sorry, yeah, yeah. threat them and um this was this was something that uh, worried me for some time. It never happened to mm -hmm. me, uh, but but I felt that that it was a bit of a vulnerable place for me mm -hmm. because um, we, I mean, as scientists, we are. I'm, I'm not in the beginning. I, I have to say I was not interested in the crime as such, mm -hmm. but in the insects and how insects feed on and on this decomposing material and and all the ecological processes mm -hmm. the biology there but not in the crime as such but i felt that i didn't have the tools to to face a situation where right. i was maybe exposed to to a criminal or something mm -hmm. like that um that, that was that was worrying um but at the same time i was trying to remember all the time things and, and I'm trying to help. Um, I have to say, that I do not work as a forensic entomologist anymore. And sometimes I feel, uh, mm -hmm. because why, when, you, when you work in this field, uh, as, uh, forensic entomology can be very tough because mm -hmm. you get to know sad stories all the time. I mean, that 
and when it happens in a criminal manner is it is touching and it's yeah. difficult to to understand and, and to deal with you you get to know a person who had a life mm -hmm. and who has family and mm -hmm. the and a scientist that we don't have a right hand psychologist that is not no. oh it's okay you can mm -hmm. do it <laughs> no yeah. no it's, it's just we as with our science and that's it mm -hmm. so i felt very vulnerable uh, sometimes uh, but i i guess you have to do it and you want to do it <laughs> yeah. If, yeah i feel like if you have a clear um targets that you want to have it's like like do this work or you know, it can be i guess it could be worth it i want to let this stop you mm -hmm. i guess yeah. um yeah i mean lots of things can discourage someone job market <laughs> crap oh. uh, it's um it's just how many scientists don't get um we also don't get trained to talk to people whose life's been touched by crime, for example. Mm -hmm. Like I wouldn't know. Like I'm I'm I have so much empathy for people. I would probably like cry with them, but you have to be like the scientist, right? You learn how to study your specimen and do your job, but then if other outside factors come in, that must be wild. <laughs> because yeah. I talk to the public, but paleontology it's mostly you know young people kids often being like super excited and knowing at least as much as i do about a certain <laughs> this thing. and and it's a very different um work environment yeah you know so yeah. being very sheltered i guess but i also never learned how to talk to people about science which is kind of something that yeah. comes over I, time. I guess as i mean probably people would say that in a museum you shouldn't feel any danger and you're a scientist mm. working with dead animals what could happen what could yeah, go yeah. wrong <laughs> right? yeah. uh, but when you start publishing and your publications uh, this is not ha that happened to me mm -hmm. but to our colleagues and you start promoting conservation of certain areas where there are some resources that some the, there are yeah. some other interests on these areas uh, it can be dangerous mm -hmm. in some places uh, so Mm, probably not me, but some other mm -hmm. colleagues have probably failed and expected conservation. Uh, yeah. You know, um, yeah. I think that can can happen. Probably not just to women in science, but I know that when I did events here, people um, when people come to an institution already with the agenda, they're asking certain questions that maybe, you know, they don't want to learn something, then spread what they think about. Like when you work with stuff that has to do with evolution, sometimes people don't believe in that and they will try to, you know, question you in a certain way. Yeah. And that has only happened to a student and luckily I had my supervisor was like, you can talk to her, she knows. <laughs> <laughs> and I could kind of uh, divert that conversation because I was a bachelor student and had never encountered a situation like that before. But that's when I learned, even though 99.9999% of the people that come here want to learn and they're super interested, there's maybe one in many, many people that doesn't want to learn. They just want to ask difficult questions, you know, yeah. with, with an agenda. But I don't hear many men complaining about that. I think it's often <laughs> often women. But, but sometimes these people can pose some some questions that are interesting. Yeah. And we don't think about them sometimes. I, yesterday I was in the dinner with some friends and I talk about this event. Mm -hmm. Like, ah, okay, but it's going to be easy because it's just um, scientific questions and this is something we know how to. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I was like, no, there will be public and people yeah. will. Uh, sorry ask uh, questions that are probably very basic but those basic questions sometimes we don't have answers for yeah. are the basic questions in science answered mm -hmm. That's so true. so yeah. sometimes it can be that we don't know what we know of course about science we are trained and all these things but these questions at a point where through the journey of science, yeah, you know, it's, true. it's very interesting to, to talk to, 
I mean, even if sometimes they are a little bit challenging with their questions. Mm -hmm. I don't want to challenge what you know. <laughs> but I think we had lots of good questions today. Definitely people will also with scientific backgrounds, I think. Yeah. So it was definitely not my mom. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if she's watching. She doesn't speak very well, but possibly. <laughs> I have friends who are watching. Yeah. On I YouTube? Think, yeah, yeah. I believe. Yeah, there's still like uh, 12 people on YouTube watching. Okay. So definitely. Oh, getting a bit. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think if there, um, oh wait, there's, more, there's another YouTube question. What is the worst disaster failure you have in your lab? That is a good question. Oh, it's the biggest disaster you're allowed to say. You won't imagine. I, this, this disaster, there is a disaster for me, but maybe for the rest of the world, it's, they don't even get it. Okay. So, you know that types holotypes uh -huh. are very special spe uh, specimens. Maybe we should um, remind people again what so holotypes the, the are. So the holotypes are that specimen you select to describe a new species. So you describe all the anatomical features that you want to tell other scientists are important to recognize these new species and you describe them based on that mm -hmm. particular specimen. So scientifically that specimen is gold, is very important. So one day, in a museum, I won't tell the name. <laughs> you had a list of the ones you worked at. <laughs> it was not a big museum. <laughs> oh, okay, no, good point. And, uh, you know, I was working with a type, and the fly study, I didn't say that, but I'm not going to say it. We identified them using the main genitalia. So imagine the size of the genitalia of a fly. Mm -hmm. It's really, really tiny, yeah. right? After Business there, but it's small. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, that day I was working on a table and I was carefully removing one of the parts of the male genitalia. And you know, because they are dry and I was uh, doing this almost uh, in a, on a dry surface and with dry tools, because they are dry, they tend to jump away. <laughs> oh right? no, I know yes. what's gonna happen. So the uh, penis, Oh, that fly, fly away. It flew, it flew away. <laughs> oh, so no. around the floor, this kind of, uh, how do you call floor? The oh, no. stone this mimic thing. like texture. It's exactly. really oh. So it was not like white where you can find. No, it was with little. <laughs> Okay, this is going to take a while. <laughs> Did you find it? Yes, I found it. Found it there. So I was maybe four and a half, four, on my on my oh knees God. and I'm just walking around, trying not to to step on anything because I, I I would only step on places that I already searched. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I did it for yeah maybe an hour and a half or two hours, and then I just gave up. I said. Okay, I'm one the of the scientists gone. who did the worst science. And, we, and I, time passed, I went to the toilet and I was like, ah, okay. And then I went to the toilet, sorry, you will see how I go to the toilet. I <laughs> sat there and then I was trying, look it, looking down, and then I saw on my, I had a skirt, on my skirt, a little something, and I said, is that? Is that thing I found, and then I just collected very quickly with my hands, took it to the lab without knowing this little thing yeah. was, uh, was the you were hoping, I was yeah. hoping, and it was, oh. and it was. So I managed to say, but this is this is very important. I mean, I have studied holotypes that someone described in the 1800s mm -hmm. or around her. So these specimens are carefully um, cared and preserved in museums. So really, if, if you damage a holotype, yeah. I mean, you would be in history. I mean, you are not from the thing. No, <laughs> so oh gosh. It was, it, it was very, very stressing. I believe but, that. Yeah, I was almost uh, ready to make a poster on the door. Want it. <laughs> Want it. <laughs> Please tell me to find this thing. Yeah. Oh, that was a great story. <laughs> Many years ago. Um, someone who won't be named took out, um, yeah, I want to say it was like it's part of it, like a, it was a dinosaur, like a dinosaur bone, but I, I 
maybe it was like a humorous or something. So um, a quite long, large book. And what you're also supposed to do always is very carefully um, grab it with two hands, you know, to mm -hmm. kind of like make hold it correctly. But that person, senior scientist, grabbed it just on one end, and I don't know why, <laughs> or <laughs> and it just broke in half. <gasps> and we're like, <gasps> and she's like, ah, it's fine. It happens all the time. We like the problem in the whole type of anything, but um to show me like all the different draws we have and um, stuff I can work on because you also have draws of dinosaur bones, right? Not just flat. And it broke in half and I am horrified. I know. Immediately I said, if this happens to me, do I have to pay money? <laughs> and she was like, no, 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 it's, it's fine. It happens. Don't worry about it. Be careful, but don't do this. <laughs> and honestly, I was paranoid ever since. I was I just know. so yeah. careful always because stuff breaks yeah, yeah. happens yeah. that that i told you also happened to me as a student mm. i mean if it happens to me right now i think i would know what to do yeah. i i probably i don't know i would find out yeah, yeah, yeah. something because actually these accidents happen yeah they, I mean, they it do. is true yeah. it happens uh, but as a student no you you're so scared right yeah. you're so scared you <laughs> yeah. no it's um yeah it was... but that reminds me of Again, why is so important digitization? Imagine that you have hundreds of, hundreds of scientists going to drawers and uh -huh. handling holotypes. If you create photos um, and people don't even need to travel mm -hmm. from abroad to see them, yeah, they can just you know. sit at home on a Sunday yeah. afternoon, what, yeah. drinking coffee, drinking coffee. <laughs> look at your holotype yeah. without so much yeah. damage. Yeah, <laughs> so if they are questions i think wow we promise. yeah <laughs> see that, that just shows like, <laughs> more questions i think we're at the end thank you so much for joining thank honestly you. it's such a good time <laughs> i didn't know we had like i had so many questions about and stuff. <laughs> thank you very much yeah i tend to talk a little bit too much